Hey, good morning, Trinity. Happy New Year. Um, so next week, there's going to be no more Christmas tree. We're going to take down all the lights. And the idea is that uh, Christmas season ends on January 6th. And um, that is Epiphany, if you don't know what that is. Or here in Puerto Rico, El Dia de los Reyes. Feliz Reyes, or in good Puerto Rican, Triquinde, right? That's how we say it here. Um, so, but Epiphany, if you're not familiar with it, it's, it's the culmination of Christmas. So Christmas actually starts on December 25th, and then you have the 12 days of Christmas, and then it ends, the 12th day is January 6th, Epiphany. And Epiphany, if you're not familiar with it, if you don't grow up in that tradition, it, um, it, it's celebrating the moment when not only that the Jews realized that their king had come, but pagans and Gentiles realize it. Why? Because, because Jesus isn't just the king of the Jews. He's the, king, he's the king of the whole world, of the whole universe. And so we see this acknowledgement, this broader acknowledgement in the Magi, right? The wise man who traveled from the east and whose response to Jesus is the only right response. And so um, Three Kings, or Reyes, here in Puerto Rico, it is uh, quite an awesome. Um, we, uh, North Americans don't celebrate it that much. It's a big deal here. My kids um, are super into it. What, what kids do here is they grab like a, 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 a shoebox or something. They fill it with grass on January 5th. And on January 6th, they come back, the grass is gone, and there's presents. And the, and the, the idea is that the, the camels from the kings, right, come ate it, and they, you know, they, in, in, you know, in response or whatever, they give them some gifts. It's awesome. And, and it's as big of a deal present-wise as December 25th. So just heads up, is a really big deal. Highly sentimental. Now, because Reyes in um, El Dia de los Reyes is such a sentimental a part of the culture, it's really easy to forget the horror of what we're actually talking about Matthew 2, where this is all recorded, and we're going to study it today, is perhaps the bloodiest chapter in all, all of um, the New Testament. So um, uh, traditions that are really in touch with uh, church history, like uh, Roman Catholics or the Orthodox, they know this. We, we make this joke that like evangelicals, um, evangelicals, their church history starts with Billy Graham. Right? So, not, not so. You, you guys have the privilege of being in a Reformed tradition, so we really like church history. But there's this book, right? It's called the Synaxarian. I might have told you about this book before. But what the Synaxarian is, and, and you see this in these traditions, it's a compilation of biographies of the earliest Christians who died for their faith. All right? So, a bunch of martyrs. And the Synaxarian, if you were to look into it, it records that 14,000 infants were slaughtered at the hands of Herod the Great's soldiers as Herod attempted to sort of kill all, uh, try, try to kill Jesus as a baby. Now, we don't like to tell that part of the story. Like, we don't, no one's talking about it. It's kind of a Debbie Downer. Like, hey, Garcia, we're trying to have a nice Christmas here. Would you, like, pipe it down with all the blood and the crosses? But... Uh, and I think what that is, is we kind of prefer the claymation Jesus, right? Uh, who's cutely stays in the manger. But here's the deal. Historically, when people think about the birth of Jesus, no one uh, just thinks of it as just a cute little story. There's kind of a weightiness and a gravity to it. And so Matthew, the author, the story that we're about to read, he has this really sophisticated way of reflecting on this story, of telling it with all the events, and he transmits it in such a way that the reader or the listener can discover these various responses to the birth of Jesus. And the idea is, is you will identify with one of these groups or one of these responses. So we're going to study this text. This is, again, this is Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And we are going to look and study it, looking at the three different groups and the three responses or reactions to the birth of Jesus. All right? So with that introduction, let's dive into the very best part of the sermon. Uh, stand with me, please, in reverence to God's word, if you can. This is uh, Matthew chapter 12. Please open your Bibles or your bulletins. 
And um, here is how, here's the reading of God's word. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all of the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy, and going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. And they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Just so we can hear the, how this story concludes, please jump with me to verse 16. This is what verse 16 says. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were, and all in that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he ascertained from the wise men. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God stands forever. May he bless it for all of us. Amen. You may be seated. So the, um, the first character we want to look at and the first response to the birth of Christ uh, is going to be Herod the Great. Now, uh, there are a handful of Herods in the New Testament. It can get a little bit confusing. This one, Herod the Great, he, um, he is known for being a really cruel and uh, uh, he's a tyrant. He's guilty of killing his own wife, his sons. And a few of his relatives. In fact, we're told, history tells us that at his own funeral, he had a few of the nobles murdered so that there would be people sad enough to be crying at his funeral. I'm the dude's a maniac. He is known, Herod the Great is known for his ruthlessness, but he's also known for something else. He's known for his building projects. He actually financed a few theaters, a few palaces, and a few temples. Most importantly, Herod the Great is known for renovating the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. So he is credited with restoring the temple so that the Jews could begin to uh, inaugurate again or start again their sacrificial system as it was practiced in the Old Testament because for, for you know, centuries it had stopped. Now, as a result of that one particular act, Herod came to be known. It, it shaped his reputation, and he was known as Herod king of the Jews. All right, you're following me there? Why is that important to understand? When the magi come into town, who, do, who is it they ask for? Look there at verse 2. They ask, where is he who is born king of the Jews? So this awakened the maniac's anger. Herod, right? Herod is the king of the Jews, and yet there's this rumors of this baby who would supplant him. Herod knew that there could only be one king, right? And so that's the occasion that kind of wakes up Herod's anger that we see in verse 16 that leads him to order the slaughter of every child to and under. There can only be one king. Herod knows this because one king always supplants the other, right? That's how the thing works. If Herod were to recognize and acknowledge a new king, then he'd have to step down and obedience and submission. So Herod attempted to do what all people attempt to do when they're not ready to give up their thrones. They try to kill God. 
Like, try to kill God. No, Herod literally tried to hunt down this newborn king and murder him. That's what he tried to do. That's what we're told. Now, that might seem really primitive to you, but um, might I suggest that modern people are guilty of something actually really similar. Y'all remember Nietzsche, Nietzsche, Frederick Nietzsche's famous words? He says, God is dead, God remains dead, and we have killed him. Famous words. We're still trying to kill God, even in our modern times. Now listen, Nietzsche is not saying we killed God in some literal sense. What he's saying is, what he's making the argument through this sort of new the modernity and post-modernity, what he's saying is that through our education, through our reasoning and logic, the ascent of the mind, the Christian God is no longer a credible source in, uh, or, or a source for uh, absolute morals or, or, or truth, right? And so really, even in the 20th century, you guys, uh, there has been a surge of very polished thinkers in a variety of disciplines that have made faith in Jesus Christ really um, seem outdated. The, it, it, you think about it like in the sciences, for instance. Uh, this, the, the sciences have, have come to, um, a, as a discipline, insist, insist that the totality of reality or the totality of truth It can only be discovered through empirical or natural means. And so these notions of like miracles, guys like us who believe in miracles or or resurrection, that the dead will be made alive, that is relegated to the realm of mythology, right? It's not even just the sciences. It's literature too. For instance, uh, you might have heard of this kind of language, the historical critical method. You take that that sort of apparatus, historical critical method, plus some version of like uh, Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code, right? You put that all together, what do you have? You basically have reduced the Bible to this document that is forged in lies, forged in politics, and it just cannot be trusted. And so no one trusts the Bible, right? Uh, Philosophy, same thing. Uh, really important thinkers, like for instance, this guy from France, his name's Jacques Derrida. I don't know if you guys know them, but he, he begins to really introduce this idea of deconstruction. And on what happens with deconstruction, what, like when misused and weaponized, it begins to separate the meaning of a thing from the object of the thing. Okay, I'm, I'm talking too much about this stuff, but it basically makes God, the notion of God, incomprehensible, right? Now listen, I'm all for higher education. I've, uh, I've been in school so much in my life. It's ridiculous and irresponsible. I'm sure of it. Um, I'm all for education, but I am gravely aware that it can be co-opted, weaponized, and used not as an instrument of discovering truth. People don't want education to find truth, but to dethrone God. <laughs> to dethrone God. So instead of uh, submitting to the world's rightful king, we have created this unexamined intellectual culture that allows us, makes us feel good about usurping Christ's throne. And we're highly, highly motivated to create intellectual justifications that keep us on our thrones. In other words, we just keep God dead. And so logic, you guys, logic is just this tool that we use to serve our own hidden interests of keeping our thrones. That's how it works. I'm an academic, so I'm just telling you that's a thing. So what happens is, and if you're a student or a professor, you know what I'm talking about on this, but to assume the non-existence of God is absolutely expected. It's a starting point. While belief in God... It's outdated. It's anti-intellectual. God must remain dead in our academic circles. And so, honestly, and here's what happens, is that, like, really robust faith in Jesus is a little bit embarrassing. It's a little bit cringing. At best, at best, you are allowed to be balanced. That's the language we use. And by balanced, what, we're, what we mean is a little bit of religion is okay, but don't take your faith too seriously. That's what balance, that's code. And the worst possible criticism is that you would be called a fanatic. 
right? Ooh, that cuts deep if someone calls you a fanatic. Scary words for our professional lives. And so it's stigmatized, and there's a lot of pressure, you guys, to assimilate into God-killing culture. Uh, just like one example, like uh, if you were to write uh, research uh, essays and you were to send them to a fancy-schmancy journal, the idea is that they would be peer-reviewed. That's a thing. And the idea is that it kind of maintains intellectual rigor, which we want. But what happens now is that peer review has turned into peer pressure, and they become the gatekeepers. And so true things are now kept out if they don't fit into the community's narrative and ideology. You see, I'm, I, I'm, I'm talking a lot here, but like, one more example. Uh, one more example, like in the social sciences. This is my life, so y'all get to just peek in in my world a little bit. But in the social sciences, it's like highly documented, for instance, that fatherlessness and divorce is the number one predictor of poverty. It's the number one predictor of pro poverty. And yet, to even suggest that through studies that show this amazing correlation, you are seen, at, it's highly unpopular to say that, I think is what I'm saying, because um, it, it comes with these assumptions that there is a, a moral, uh, you know, that there is a design for marriage, right? That things are, there's an ought to how families should work, how daddies should work. And it's all laced and presumed with morals that are not permitted in these academic circles. So it's really unpopular. Okay, so the, here, the solution here, you guys, is not to avoid uh, intellectual rigor or academic. All the, and I, I say that because, listen, sometimes Christians have been pretty anti-intellectual. Can we just say that sometimes Christians drive us crazy and haven't been intellectually rigor, rigorous enough? So it's not to run away from these things, but it is, but it is a call for us to be the best professionals in our fields, but to do bravely and warmly do so in profound alignment to this king. Like Herod, who literally tried to kill God, we do live in this God-killing culture, uh, this pressure. Have you guys, I mean, have you ever felt that heat for being a Christian? Felt that a little bit? I'm not making this up. If you've never felt it, if you've never felt a little bit of heat from your culture, it might be because you've assimilated. I say that reverently, but you've never felt the heat because no one knows that you just love Jesus. And so um, you have to ask, have I genuinely submitted to his throne or am I just keeping my own? Remember, one king will always supplant the other. Don't keep, don't keep your thrones like Herod. All right, let's begin. Let's continue. That's the first character, Herod. He tried to kill God. There's a second group now briefly mentioned in verses 4 and 5. Look back in your Bibles. Verse 4, it says, And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so is written by the prophet. All right, let me just, the chief priests and the scribes, these are the religious people, right? These are the people who went to church. These are the people who knew the Messiah would be coming. In fact, Herod, right, Herod, King Herod has no religious knowledge. He has to go to the religious experts to get the, get the you know, the down low, so these religious people, they knew about this prophecy. It was written 700 years before that the king was going to be born in Bethlehem. And that's what you see in verse 6. Look there, you'll notice that it's indented. It's a quote. You, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, you're by no means the least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. That, Matthew chapter 2, verse 6, is in a direct quote from Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Now, that's a really impressive prophecy, everyone. Like, there's a lot of things that you can choose in your life. You can choose your hair color. You can choose the car that you drive. You can choose the university you go to. But let me tell you what you can't choose. You can't choose where your mama was when she had you, right? Just, that's not up to you. You don't get a vote in that. And yet it was prophesied, and Jesus was indeed born in Bethlehem. Now, here's what's really interesting about this to me. Although the religious leaders, they knew about Jesus, 
They knew. They did nothing about it. Right? There's no, when you look at your nativity scenes, right? There's no religious people there. You have shepherds. You have the wise men. There's no religious people at the nativity scene, right? Pagan magi. These wise men traveled hundreds, if not thousands of miles to find Jesus. Meanwhile, religious leaders from the same religion could not walk six miles to see their king. What's going on here? I mean, clearly, they were not impressed with the arrival of the Messiah. What's going on here? What's going on here? Here's what it is. They had no appetite. They had no appetite for what Christ would bring. And, and let me illustrate this. I'm not sure if I've shared this illustration, but when I was in college at the university, um, a f- group of friends, we decided it's a Saturday night. We're going to go out and watch a movie together. It's going to be great. But I'm like a poor, broke college student. I don't want to eat out. There's some a whole leftover pizza in my fridge. It was cold. So, you know, I pound out this whole cold pizza. I mean, it's kind of gross, but it's food. Made me a little bit sick, but whatever. I'm not spending money that night except on the movie. So we get together with my friends, and we're heading to the movie theater, and we pass this pizza restaurant, and on their billboard it says, Congratulations, Air Force. All cadets eat free, right? So what had happened is like the Air Force Academy, we'd won a bowl game, a football game, and so they were celebrating, and so they were doing a solid for all the cadets, right? So like in my car, it just erupted in absolute joy. Everyone's like stoked. I mean, free pizza, right, for like poor college students is a big deal. Everyone was excited. Guess who was not excited? This guy right here. I didn't even want to look at pizza. I had lost my appetite for pizza. See, traditionally, I would have liked pizza, but I'd lost my desire for it. Listen, these religious people, by tradition, they liked the idea of a Messiah. They lost their appetite for him. In fact, they lost their need for him. They lost their need. For... Let me explain how. Um, if, you're not, uh, if you're not real familiar with the Old Testament and the Bible, I'm going to really summarize how this works really quickly so you can understand what's happening. In the Old Testament, God put into place the series of laws and animal sacrifices. So the idea is that Israel, the people of God, they're supposed to obey the laws and make sacrifices with these animals for their sins. Now listen very closely. The blood of the animals did not, did not pardon their sins But these slain animals pointed to their need for mercy, their need for provision. And so the law and the sacrifices were practiced as an act of faith in the coming provision, in the coming Savior, not not as a means for forgiveness, okay? That's how come, like, when John the Baptist in the New Testament first lays eyes on Jesus, like, he calls him a sacrificial animal. He says, Behold, the Lamb of God, right? Like the kind that we slaughter. Who takes away the sins of the world? That's what he's he's tying that back to the whole system, right? But these religious leaders, they liked religion. They liked the system, but they didn't like Jesus. And so what they do, they begin to manipulate the whole system, and they taught, they begin to teach that God would accept you if you kept the law and the sacrifices. In other words, let me just summarize that for you in modern parlance. Be a good person, and God will accept you. Be a good person, and God will accept you. That's what legalists say. They're legalists. And people who didn't keep up the law as good as they did, they just kind of look down their nose at them. And here's the point, guys. Because of their new system, Jesus was totally unnecessary. The coming Messiah is inconsequential to their system. Who needs to be saved when you can save yourself with your good works? Are y'all following the logic here? Dare I say it, that idea is so prevalent inside and outside our churches. There is a kind of fundamentalism, legalism, in and outside. It's all over our world. It's the same system. So for like non-religious people, the mantra is, 
just be a kind person, be a good person. Now, I'm not really sure how we define good person, but usually they define good by whatever their life looks exactly like, right? Their life is good. Everyone thinks they're the good person, right? No, one, no one's like, yeah, I'm the bad person around here. No one says that, right? So we define being good according to what we look like. And, uh, and so who needs a savior if you're good? You see, it's really interesting in our national conversation, the secular discourse, like the, both the left and the right, if you listen carefully, they both use really moralistic language. Like if you're on the left, to be a good person means you care about these issues and the other people are bad. And if you're on the right, to be a good person means you care about these issues and then the others are bad. But everyone's looking at whatever system it is to decide if they're good or not. It's very fundamentalist, moralistic language on both the left and the right. But to say that Jesus... In indicism, to say that Jesus takes away your sins, it's unintelligible. Like, people like, to even talk like that, hey, Jesus will take away your sins. Like, to talk like that to your secular friends, it's, it's like, I don't even know why you would say that. It's like a non sequitur. It doesn't make any sense to the system. Who cares about sins when I'm good, right? The world needs kindness, I get that, but forgiveness? But forgiveness? Y'all see what I'm saying? Now, for religious people, uh, us, by the way, uh, the mantra is kind of like that, but a little bit, there's a little bit, uh, another writer on there. It's be a good person and sprinkle in a little bit of church in Jesus, <laughs> right? Um, and that is especially helpful, right, when you're having a hard time, right? Uh, you can pick up the bat phone, God help me out here. Right, But otherwise, you, you know, God is relegated to the side. Not that important to our system. Um, if, when, when churches begin to like, like have like a Christianized version of that legalism, that secular fundamentalist legalism, church gets really uncomfortable and a little bit weird. I'm telling you, if you have ever been hurt in a church, and I'm sure a few of you have, it found its source in some, someone hurting you in that way just a little bit. It, it's when there's a culture of good works instead of a culture of mercy. And then you have all these unspoken rules like, are you a homeschooler or not a homeschooler? Are you into vaccines or not vaccines? What kind of music do you listen to? Does do your shorts go past your fingertips? Like, we're all, like, you know what I mean? It gets weird. And so what happens is everyone begins to evaluate one to see if you're obeying all the unspoken rules. It's really uncomfortable and awkward. Uh, but we do that so that we feel good about ourselves. We feel good in our religious lives if we obey our own rules. But there is no day-to-day -day deep, profound desperation for God's mercy. There's no, there's no profound sense that I really need to walk six miles and fall on my knees and worship the Lord desperately. Like, we don't, not that. We're just policing each other. It's so uncomfortable. Um, I want y'all to make sure that we're relating to God on the basis of grace not on the basis of our moral performance. And that's what I want you to hear. Um, if you relate to God on the basis of good works, ultimately you are making Jesus unnecessary. You don't even need him because you got this. Is that you? <laughs> Is that you? Listen to me. Is that you? Are you religious but not really that desperate for Jesus? And if this is you, would you have the courage to admit it? I mean, do you just have the courage to say, you know what? I think I am kind of religious and not desperate for Jesus. Or would you pray something like, my God and my King, I in reality cannot live a single moment without your mercy and forgiveness just saturating my soul. Come be near to me, Lord, in 2021. Amen. Could you... Would you pray like that? That's the religious leaders. All right, so we looked at the response of Herod, God killer. We looked at the religious leaders, 
making Jesus unnecessary. Let's look at this final group in in the story, and this is the three kings. I've got some really bad news, especially for my Puerto Rican brothers. Um, Contrary to tradition, they weren't kings, right? They're wise men, they're magi, and there weren't three. We, We just know that there's plural, right? They did bring three gifts, but we don't actually know. It could be two, it could be 100, I don't know. Um, But what are magi or wise men? Basically, they're these Gentile priests that likely practiced astrology and dream interpretation. And what they did is they offered wisdom to rulers. So they acted like political advisors on royal courts. That's what, that's what these wise men are. So it's commonly believed in the ancient Near East that really important things that happened on earth were reflected in the stars and vice versa. That's what they believed. And so that's why verse 2, I look, they look there in verse 2, it says, where is he who is born king of the Jews? For, the wise men say, for we saw his star when it rose. Something happened on earth, it's reflected in the stars, and we have come to worship him. So these ambassadors, they see the star, they make the trek from the east, likely Armenia or Babylonia, right? And, and, and it's common, again, in the ancient world for royal regimes to send emissaries to neighboring countries to give gifts to, um, to recognize a new sovereign, a new king. So it's actually a very peaceful act of diplo- diplomacy. That's what's happening here. So apparently, this trek, these wise men, made, is a, they have a large convoy, just if you're going to make these long treks, you need all kinds of logistics. So it's a lot of people. It's very, very expensive. And it, ta- and it took them a very long time to arrive there. Contrary to our nativity scenes. Oh, gosh, I'm ruining all the sentimentality of our art here. But here we go. Contrary to this, the nativity scenes, the magi, they don't actually arrive to the, ma- to the manger. They arrive to a house. Look at verse 11. And going into the house, they, being the wise men, You'll say that they're going into the house, not the barn. They saw the child with Mary. So another thing to just point out to you guys is that quite a bit of time has actually elapsed from the time that Jesus was born to the arrival of the wise men. Jesus at this point is likely between one and two years old. That's how come Herod tried to kill all the infants ages two and under. There's this range. He's not just killing newborns. All of them. So he's, he's trying to get like, you know, a, a range of, uh, of children had to be killed. So, well, what happens though, you guys, is really shocking. I'm going to think about this with me. So the magi, these wise men, they go to the palace. Why? Because kings live in palaces. But they realize that Herod is an imposter. They didn't drop off their gifts there. They kept looking. Finally, they find him, not wrapped in purple. It didn't matter. They didn't just pay homage to a sovereign. They worshipped him. They worshipped him. Look at verse 11. Going into the house, they saw the child with Mary's mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. I mean, I want you guys just to think about this with me. Something happened in the stars that was so spectacular that royal dignitaries from a different country from a different religion, under the rule of a different king, decided to take a very long and expensive trip. And they kept going until they came into an ordinary house, only to see a poor and uneducated couple with a baby that smells like a barn. No crown, no robes, no armies, no scepters. And what did they do? These Powerful men forsake their allegiance to their local deities and they convert. And they forsake their old king and they fall on their knees and they worship this king, believing him to be the one true God. And once they beheld this child, incarnate God, Everything else in their world seems trivial. Their most powerful position back where they come from, all of it, nothing can compare to this child. They would give anything to be in the truth. Listen, you guys. Every time in the Bible that someone truly meets Jesus Christ, they truly meet him, there's only one of three responses 
either they try to kill him, they flee from him and dismiss him and relativize him, or they worship him and they give their lives to him. There's never a, oh, well, that's cute, and then it's back as business as usual. Listen, one could only go back to their ordinary, usual life if you've never had an encounter with the true living God. Which one are you? Listen, don't, these are sacred moments right now. Don't, don't let this moment pass. Which one are you? Matthew writes the story so that you can see yourself in one of the reactions. Which one are you? Let me just um, quickly conclude with just one more feature in this text um, that will help us really understand Jesus for who he is. Because, man, that's what I want for you. I want you to know him. I want you to understand really what we're talking about. In verse 11... We're told that the wise men, these magi, they brought gold, they brought frankincense. Frankincense is just a, a really fancy incense, it's aromatic, and they brought myrrh. Now, gold and frankincense were very common gifts for kings, but myrrh, myrrh is a little bit curious, you guys. There's really two uses that we know in the ancient world for myrrh. You can add it to water or to a liquid so that when it's ingested, it will numb pain. So it works as like uh, an anesthetic. But it's also an oil that you would use to anoint a body for burial. Okay, that's how myrrh is used. So why was this gift given to Jesus at his birth? It's kind of like you have a baby and then you're having a baby shower and I come to your baby shower, and I give you this gift certificate for a burial plot for your child, like, that's really a generous gift, but totally inappropriate. Y'all see what I'm saying? Why give Jesus myrrh? What? Why does Matthew tell us that Jesus gets myrrh? It hints and it foreshadows his very purpose. His life was moving very intentionally to a cross where he would die. Even as the wise men gave a gift to Christ, Christ was giving himself to them. And guess what? Christ is giving himself to you. What will you do with that? Either you say, I believe it, or you say, I don't believe it, but it can't be business as usual, right? If, if this is all true, and it is, these are sacred moments. Trinity, 2021 20, has begun. These are sacred moments. What are you going to do? What, what is the course of the future that you are going to chart? I know it sounds too good to be true, but it is true. I pray that 2021 would be marked with true faith to the incarnate King.